The next accounting standard that I would discuss is about IS 16, which is the property, plant and equipment. Property, plant and equipment. Uh, when we talk about the definition of the property, plant and equipment, so what is the definition of a property, plant and equipment? So the property, plant and equipment are the tangible items which are held for use in production of goods or for rendering of services or for administrative purposes and they are expected to last for more than they are expected to last for more than 12 months so let me repeat that whenever we talk about the property plan and equipment in accordance with IAS 16 Property plant equipments are the tangible items that are held for use in the production of goods or for the rendering of services or for the administrative purposes. They are expected to last for more than 12 months. The property plant equipment uh, could initially be recognized. The property plant equipment could initially be recognized when probable future economic benefits. When probable future economic benefits will flow to entity. And the number two is that the cost can be estimated reliably. And the number two is that the cost can be estimated reliably. When we talk about the initial recognition of the property plant equipment, the initial recognition of the property plant equipment is that the probable future economic benefits will flow to the entity and the cost can be estimated reliably. That's an important thing that you would have to keep in mind. If I move a bit forward and discuss further, so what could possibly is going to be that what is the, what will be the initial measurement of the property plant equipment. So when we talk about the initial measurement of the property plant equipment, so repeat, remember that the property plant equipment are initially going to be recognized at a cost. What is going to happen is the property plant equipment are initially going to be recognized at a cost. What is the cost of the property plant equipment? That's the purchase price plus the directly attributable cost and in addition to the directly attributable cost, there is going to be the dismantling cost or the site restoration cost, etc, etc, etc. When it comes to the dismantling of the site restoration cost, remember that what we do is that we recognize them at present value. What we do is that we recognize them at present value. When it comes to the subsequent measurement of the property plan equipment, so the subsequent measurement of the property plant equipment is going to be either at a cost model or it is either going to be at revaluation model. Remember that whichever model that you opt for, you have to make sure that the entire class of asset, you have to make sure that the entire class of asset is measured using same model. What do you have to make sure? You have to make sure that the entire class of asset is measured using the same model. So how do we establish the, um, how do we actually go about with the cost model? So with respect to the cost model, you say that the net book value of the carrying amount of the asset is going to be established this way, uh, which is going to be cost less accumulated depreciation, less accumulated impairment cost. What is it going to be? Cost less accumulated depreciation, less accumulated impairment loss. When it comes to the revaluation model, it is going to be valuation less subsequent accumulated depreciation and less subsequent accumulated impairment. When it comes to the revaluation model, this is how you're going to be um, recognizing the revaluation model, which is it's going to be valuation less subsequent accumulated depreciation less subsequent accumulated impairment loss. IS-16 requires you that when it comes to the depreciation, so what happens is the depreciation involves various estimates. Uh, the way various estimates could be the depreciation method itself. The various estimates could be the life of the life of the assets. The various estimates could be the residual value, etc, etc, etc. What you are required to do with respect to the depreciation computation is you need to make sure that the estimates are reviewed 
at each reporting date. So what you need to do is that you need to make sure that the estimates are reviewed at each reporting date. So just like in case if there is a change in the life, in the residual value or in the method of depreciation that you wish to bring about, you can bring about such a change. So ultimately what you have to do is that you have to ensure that you do it at each reporting date. With respect to the with respect to the revaluation, so you need okay. There is one more thing with respect to the depreciation, which is that at times you have got assets uh, which are itself uh, which have got significant components. Now, uh, what do we mean by assets with significant components? Such assets are commonly known as complex assets. Now, what do we mean by the complex asset? Like for example, an airplane is a complex asset. A ship is a complex asset. A refinery is a complex asset. There could be multiple types of complex assets available. What happens is, if I talk about an airplane, what happens is the interior of an airplane has a different life, maybe 20 years. The exterior of the airplane has got a different life, maybe eight years. The engines of the airplane have got a different life, maybe 5,000 flying hours, etc., etc. So usually what happens is you might have acquired an engine for airplane for 100 million, uh, but this uh, 100 million cannot be depreciated uh, using one single method because this 100 million ultimately leads you towards three different parts which are actually made up into an airplane. So what IS 16 suggests is that what you should do is that you should allocate the cost. The cost should be allocated to each of significant parts, each of significant parts. And it says each part to be depreciated each part is to be depreciated separately so what you need to do is that you need to make sure that uh, you allocate the cost to each of the significant part and each of the part is to be depreciated separately that's an important thing that you would have to keep in mind Okay, uh, let's move a bit forward and discuss further. When it comes to the application of the revaluation model, uh, remember that what happens is in case if there is an increase in the revaluation, that increase to be taken to OCI unless it reverses a previously recognized loss in p &L. And similarly, if there is a decrease in the valuation, the decrease has to be adjusted against the revaluation reserve. That decrease has to be adjusted against the revaluation reserve. That's what you would have to do. So let me repeat that when it comes to the revaluation model, this is something that you would have to ultimately do. Uh, with respect to the IAS 16, there are a few more things which need to be understood, which is about the de-recognition that when do we de-recognize the property plant equipment. So remember the property plant equipment is to be de-recognized when uh, it is disposed of or when uh, no probable future economic benefits are expected to flow to entity. So you need to de-recognize a property plant equipment when either of these things happen. So whichever is earlier, uh, you are going to de-recognize the property plant and equipment. So that was a quick summary, a short summary pertaining to IAS 16 property plant and equipment. The next accounting standard in the series is IAS 19 employee benefits. The next accounting standard is IAS 19 employee benefits. When we talk about IS-19 employee benefits, IS-19 employee benefits actually refer to the benefits that you provide to your current or your future or your past employees. 
ड्यूरिंग एम्प्लॉयमेंट और एज अ रिजल्ट ऑफ एम्प्लॉयमेंट और बिकॉज ऑफ एम्प्लॉयमेंट such benefits are going to be termed as employee benefits what is it it's actually going to be the employee benefits provided to your current future past employees uh, during the course of employment or as a result of employment or because of the employment so that is all going to be considered as an employee benefit when we talk about the employee benefit the employee benefits are of four types what are those four types of employee benefit the number one of them is called short term employee benefits the short term employee benefits are those employee benefits which are expected to be paid within the 12 months period then the next thing that actually happens is uh, is actually going to be termed as a long term employee benefit the long term employee benefits are those benefits which are payable for more than 12 months then the third one of them is called the post employment benefit a uh, post employment benefit examples include the pension the provident fund the gratuity etc etc they are all going to be considered as your post employment benefit the fourth one of them is going to be the termination benefits let me repeat the fourth one of them is going to be termination benefit and the termination benefits are those which are upon termination of employment termination of employment uh, that is going to be considered as a termination benefit examples of these different benefits is uh, short term employee benefits are salaries long term employee benefits is uh, maybe a uh, long term uh, leave or maybe permanent disability allowance post employment benefits pertain to the pension provident fund etc the termination benefits are usually uh, things like severance pay or termination a uh, bonus or etc etc these are all going to be considered as your termination benefit when we talk about the post employment benefits the post employment benefit uh, accounting for the post employment benefit depends upon the type of the post employment benefit scheme that you are operating there could be different types of post employment benefit schemes one of them is going to be considered as a defined contribution plan one of them is going to be the defined contribution plan and the other one of them is going to be termed as a defined benefit plan when it comes to a defined contribution plan generally speaking what happens with respect to defined contribution plan is there are those uh, plans where entity is legal our constructive obligation is to provide agreed amount of contribution into a separate legal entity called the fund one of the examples of this is the provident fund that what happens is each month some amount is deducted from the employee salary and when each month some amount is deducted from the employee salary an exactly similar amount is contributed into the fund by the entity so ultimately what happens is uh, in case if the fund performs well the excess amount belongs to the employee if the firm performs badly the shortfall uh, belongs to the employee so with respect to the defined contribution plan the entity's only legal or constructive obligation is to provide an agreed contribution into a separate legal entity called the fund and the rest is going to be the employee side with respect to the defined benefit plan generally what happens is the definition is any plan other than the definition is any plan other than defined contribution plan any plan other than defined contribution plan that is going to be considered as a defined benefit plan so when it comes to this defined benefit plan generally speaking what happens is we perform reconciliation of fair value of plan assets we perform reconciliation of present value of defined benefit obligations how do we perform the reconciliations we say the opening fair value uh, we say that uh, interest income and then what happens is there is actually the contributions which are made into the funds uh, the benefits paid 
and uh, what happens is uh, the benefits paid and then the remeasurement gain or loss which is going to be the balancing figure and what happens is you have got the closing fair value of plan asset similarly when it comes to the present value of the defined benefit obligation uh, you go about it this way opening present value of defined benefit obligation uh, then the next thing is that you've got the interest uh, cost or the interest expense then the service cost and the service cost could include the current service cost the service cost could include the past service cost the service cost could include the gain or loss on uh, settlement so these are the all of these things that can exist with respect to this uh, service cost then there is going to be the benefits paid and uh, then what happens is uh, you've got the remeasurement gain or loss you've got the remeasurement gain or loss and after this remeasurement gain or loss you've got the closing present value of defined benefit obligation what do you have you've got a closing present value of defined benefit obligation so what happens is uh, this is how we perform the reconciliation with respect to the defined benefit plan and when it comes to the statement of comprehensive income uh, we say that the PNL portion of the statement of comprehensive income would include the service cost would include service cost and then what happens is um, it is also going to be including the net interest the net interest is going to be the interest uh, expense less the interest income that is going to be included here and then we have got the other comprehensive income which is about the net Remeasurement gain or loss. Net remeasurement gain or loss. So hence, what happens is this is what is going to be considered as an associate. When it comes to the balance sheet, uh, the balance sheet. What happens is you have to show either a defined benefit asset or a defined benefit liability. When we talk about the defined benefit asset or a defined benefit liability, so how do we establish it? We establish it like this, which is closing. Uh, present value of defined benefit obligation and then what happens is there is this closing fair value of plan assets there is this closing present value of defined benefit obligation and the closing fair value of plan asset so resultingly what happens is you would either end up getting a defined benefit liability or you would end up getting a defined benefit asset now let's move a bit further and discuss further there is another concept which is called the asset ceiling now what exactly do you mean by this asset ceiling? Asset ceiling is whenever you come across a situation where a defined benefit asset is arising. So the maximum amount which you can recognize the defined benefit asset is the lower of. Lower of, uh, lower of uh, the amount as per calculation. Or the present value of benefits from reduced contributions or refunds so that is ultimately going to give you a limit to how the asset ceiling any the the limit that to what extent you can recognize the asset that is how it is actually going to be established so what happens is this is going to be considered as your asset ceiling uh, this is considered this is called an asset ceiling test so we are done with the core areas, the major parts of IS. Uh, uh, we are done with the major parts, the core parts of IS 19 employee benefits.